is bulk load. We are going to study this time exploratory model analysis from these authors. You can find, you are watching this presentation from YouTube. This is slide following this link. Also, you can join to the R4DS community. In Slack, we have meetings every week, every Sunday. And I would like you also to join. Each week, we will have a volunteer to present a chapter from the book after assigning your name in the volunteers uh, spreadsheet right here. So you can sign your name right there. In the presentation, we can review the material, we can have discussions, maybe you can create a live demo. So it's really an open opportunity to share what you learn in each chapter. You can also find the, the report right here and you can make your contributions to the slides uh, every time you are going to present. So yeah, by GitHub. And yeah, all the presentation are also, and this also will be in the YouTube channel of the R4DS community. Uh, we will have a book club every week, except for on holidays. We expect to have a one hour meeting each week. The goal is to cover one chapter. Uh, we can split charters or combine chart short charters. And of course, we can slow down if, if we are really fast. The point is not to go and finish all, you know, that we can learn. Uh, by reading this book. Uh, so yeah, let's introduce ourselves. I am Angel Felix. Uh, I'm joining from Dominican Republic, Santo Domingo. I have complete two book clubs. The one was an introduction to statistical learning with R and also hands-on machine learning with R. Right now, I'm also part of the, the book club of Master in Shiny and uh, package development also. I have been using ARM for three years uh, and I'm looking forward to to improve my modeling technique, not just to run a model and try to tune, also to understand what is going on and the, also the implications and to, to create better recommendations and, and give more insight to stakeholders. Ricardo, you can introduce yourself. Uh, sure. Uh, well, uh, welcome on every, everyone. My name is Ricardo Serrano. I'm based in Orlando, Florida, but I'm natural from Puerto Rico. Um, I'm, I'm uh, some previous clubs that I've done. I've done the introduction to statistical learning. Also, I did with Angel and Kiantu. We did the hands-on machine learning. I also done the feature engineering uh, based on the book by... Uh, by uh max Kun. okay uh what else a uh, time series also so i've been you know i've been around a while and i'm trying to you know keep uh keep sharpening sharpening the 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 the, the, the machine learning knife uh so how long have you been using r well uh officially i started in 2019 but i have done some uh, work before in statistic using uh, spss Okay, the statistical package, and uh, Python. Also, I I, I uh, started at the same time around 2019 with the, the data science uh, Coursera course. Um, uh, I also uh, uh, delve with C uh, programming language, and before that, even you know way back, uh, I I programmed in Fortran too. Okay, one of the one of those uh, <laughs> legacy. Legacy programming challenge uh, languages. Um, what are you most looking forward to learning? Well, I'm trying to get a little more in depth on the uh, explanation uh, part of the model. 
as we know, uh, most uh, some of these advanced models like uh, extreme gradient boosting and deep learning, uh, they're kind of a black boxes. So it's good to know what are the tools out there uh, to explain how the model ingests you know, the raw data and then gets into a, a prediction or the, the result that they're, they're giving us. So it's always good to know to know you know what is the what is the inner mechanism uh, to to be able to let explain to a technical and non-technical uh, audience. Okay, so that's it. All right, thanks, uh, Ricardo. I'll, I'll go next. Uh, hey, everybody. My name is Aaron. Uh, work in insurance analytics. Uh, joining from Chicago, Illinois. And uh, this is my first uh, R for Data Science Club, so kind of excited to learn how it works. Um, I have been using R for a while, um, started in 2016, so about eight years. Also dabbled in Python um, around, the, around the same amount of time. Uh, although R is my primary instrument these days, I use it most days on the job. And uh, as a hobby, I, I do um, power ranking models for sports and I I uh, do use uh, some, some modeling for, for betting purposes uh, for college football. Um, but, but yeah, uh, so, so I, I love R. I find myself plateauing <laughs> though, cause you know, you kind of get in a rut in terms of what techniques you're using, um, what packages you use. So uh, just joining this club to, to help me, uh, you know, advance my skill set and meet other like-minded individuals. Uh, as far as this book in particular, you know, like I'm familiar with variable importance, partial dependence plots, um, but there seems to be uh, quite a few uh, additional uh, methodologies here, techniques that um, haven't really uh, used in my day-to-day -day work. So uh, really, really excited about that. And of course, it's, it's all about interpreting what the, the black box says, right? Um, as Ricardo mentioned earlier. So yeah, um, that's, that's all I got. Uh, excuse me, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good, because, yeah, I've had issues with my mic before. Um, so my name is Zach. I work in inventory analytics. I'm based in New York. Um, this is my first um, R for Data Science um, book club. Um, I haven't been using R and Python that long, at least not professionally. I've used them in, I've used Python in college and, like, both of them in, like, personal projects I've done, but... I haven't been using them professionally for that long, um, so I I am I am ex I am excited to like like get more in depth in like RN's like statistical aspects of programming. Uh, excuse me, like statistical programming more in depth. Yep, because that that's something that really wasn't covered over the course of college, and it's not really something I use that much in my current work right now. With but I am excited to learn more about it. Right. Okay. So... Thanks. Welcome, Zach. Hi. Happy to be here. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. Yep. Okay. How are you doing? Uh, my name is Kunta Kim. I'm I'm currently from. I'm actually right now. I'm actually at the uh, uh, Davis in California because I'm a I'm a research scholar in a U University of California Davis. And then I'm currently work. I'm actually kind of working as a urban planning and transportation, and land use modeling and geo design tool. And then uh, I'm actually from the South Korea. So I but the thing is I'm working as a um, I'm working as a research scholar in the University of California Davis, the the school. So and also uh, previous clubs. So uh, uh, with Angel and with Ricardo, I. We actually studying the hands on machine learning with R before we start doing this book study club. And also, I personally facilitating in Python for data analytic uh, analysis right now. And also, I'm I'm joining the uh, R for data science and then a mastering science. And also, I study the uh, econometrics uh, with R and special data data science with R. And also 
uh, how long have you been using my R and Python? Uh, R is my my primary language, but I'm actually tried to learn in the Python recently. And then I have been using R since 2013. And then I'm quite, quite using R quite a while. And, and also before, before joining actually this kind of R community, I personally organized a uh, doctoral level study club about the statistical analysis and research method. And then uh, in that club, I actually study about about 20, 20 books related to the R and statistical analysis. And then what I'm most looking forward to the learning from this study club is because uh, this study club is more like about the, how we can we can turn interpret the interpret the uh, machine the sum of the outcome like a predictive outcome that we obtain from the machine learning and deep learning kind of a technique and then uh, how we can interpret the, those kind of features and attributes that we use in the machine learning and our it is more like an in depth and then a more like a give us the more insight about the interpretation of the, this kind of a model. And then uh, this interpretation gonna be, especially for me as urban planner and trans transportation planner, help me to deliver my predictive outcome from uh, from the this kind of modeling technique to the, especially for the some of the general audiences like the citizens or maybe local or federal government when I done with this, apply to the, this kind of a technique and then I get some result. So I think that this book gonna be help us to the, interpret the, this kind of a modeling technique a little bit further and also give me the more kind of a guideline for the, how I can help those people to understand the, this kind of outcome much more easily. So that's the things that I wanted to learn from this study club. So nice to meet you all. Thanks, Gang too. And yeah, Thanks before reading this book, you need to know to know or ARM or Python. And there are the books that we recommend in case that you don't know any of them. Then you need to learn uh, to train models, maybe using one of these package. Most of them are available Python R together, maybe using uh, it's in both languages or Java in the in the case of age of two. But basically the methodology is to split the data, resample the data, training many models, try to tune each of them and select the best one to then use the test data. That's the way this comes from from machine learning. That was a really good book to to start with this methodology. What we will learn. Uh, how to determine which exploratory variables affect the most prediction for a single observation. So we, we will know, if, oh, we have this value. Why? Ah, because this was the variables more important for this particular observation. We can here are the, the methods. Breakdown plus, ceteris, variables, profiles, local model approximation, and also uh, Sharpie values. Also, we will learn techniques to examine the predictive model as a whole, using partial dependent plots and variable important plots. We also want to learn how to create charts that can be used to present the key information in a quick way, and tools and methods uh, for model comparison. Here is the distribution of the chapters. The, the first part that we're going to see is the uh, explanation at local level. And we can see the distribution here and the, and the question that can answer each chapter. Uh, for example, which variables contribute to the selected prediction and we have all these chapters. For chapter six to nine, we will have different methods to answer that question. How does the variable affect the prediction? In chapter 10, chapter 11, does the model fit where around the prediction? We also can see how where is the model around that observation using the chapter 12. How good is the model? Chapter 15. Which variables are important to the model? 
using permutation, a variable importance, certain thing. How those variables affect the average prediction? Partial dependent plots, accumulated local effects, chapter 17 and 18. And does the model fit where in general? Chapter 19. So we will know how to interpret a local level, a general level, how to know how is the fit above in both sides at the end of the this book. So let's start the first chapter, the introduction. In this chapter, we are going to see, we introduce the concepts of predictive models, detail the evolution of statistical models, highlight the challenges and risks associated with advanced predictive models, emphasize the importance of model explanation tools to understand, evaluate, and assure ethical compliance. A predictive model is a function that predicts the values of a variable based of interest based on a variable on another variable. Basically, we are going to we want to we want to predict the y based on all the x values plus some error. For example, we can predict the risk of heart disease based on patient characteristics, political attitudes based on favorable comments. Just to, to to have some examples. The first stage of predictive models start with the least square method created by Landrich in 1805 and by Gauss in 1809 to be the first regression model for predicting continued values. We also have categorical models you are used to predict nominal variables and are introduced by Ronald Fisher in 1936. And we say categorical, you know, colors, positions, attributes that don't have a specific order. After that, many statistical models have been developed like general linear models. Here we have the logistic regression, the poison regression, uh, classification regression trees and root based models also. That is maybe you, you type the rules basically. Now we are starting the big data era. So we have more data and more computational power and we have new capacities. So we have more flexible models, uh, models that perform internal variable selection, and also we have a high precision in predictions. Most of models tend to combine hundreds and even thousands of simpler models into a super model like happens with bagging models, boosting models, or more or stacking. Large deep learning models might have over a billion of parameters. But that, that's also dangerous. We have a lot of power, but that can be a problem. The ABM's Watson for Oncology was criticized by oncologists by, for delivering unsafe and uh, inaccurate recommendations. Amazon system for curriculum vitae screaming was found to be beast against women. Uh, Algorithms behind the Apple credit card are cows being gender based, biased. So as a consequence, we have the general data protection regulation that creates a right uh, for explanation. So basically if you are affected by a mother, the company needs to explain why you have that decision, why you've been rejected or accepted from by, uh, some specific decision. And we need to understand what is the the moving change in the in the in the way that we model. In the classical statistics, we used to apply a lot of time and effort to apply a really good EDA based on domain knowledge. Then we, we, we fit a really simple linear model, maybe uh, with 
and then we try to understand if that in the validation part it, it fits the, our hypothesis. That was the method. The modern method, the machine learning method that we are using, we have a simple EDA. We, we create a lot of models and then based on cross validation, we select the best one. But the future is like we're going to have automatic EDA also. We have better automatic MLA and the part that we need to strain is our way to find out how good is the model and what decision is taking the model. So we can uh, take that feedback to the EDA process. And yeah, that would be a more uh, efficient way to train models in the future. So basically the bottleneck for this new uh, near future is to improve our ability to interpret the models. So we need more model. We need model for explanation, obtaining insight into model based predictions. Also, examination, evaluate the model's performance and understanding the weaknesses of that model. What are the, the ethics requirements that need to, to match any model that we deploy? Prediction validation, one should, one should be able to verify how strong the evidence is that supports the prediction. So we need to know how certain is the model uh, about the prediction that is given. Ah, oh, I, I give you that prediction, but I'm not really sure about it. We need to have a way to, to, to understand how much was the prediction. Also, we need prediction justification. What should be able to understand which variable affect the prediction and to what and what to extend. So what is the impact of each variable on the prediction? And also, uh, prediction and speculation. One should be able to understand how the prediction would change if the values, the values of the variables introduced in the model change. So it's like, okay, you need to tell me how certain you are about the prediction. You need to tell me what factor you are taking in consideration to make that prediction. Also, you need to explain me what will happen if we change something. It's like, oh, I was, I go, I went to a bank looking forward for a, a to to have a pre, to to loan some money, and they said, oh no, you are not applicable. Oh, you are certain that I'm not a good candidate? Yes, because we see this in your profile. You don't have this. But if you change your profile, you may this or maybe have a better salary, you will you will apply. That maybe would be the, the conversation that we expect about models. He also explained the terminology that we are going to use during this book. So Independent variables are also known as explanatory variables, predictors, covariates, input var variables, and features. Dependent variables also are known as predictor, response, output, and target. Observation are also known as instances and cases. Fit is the same as train. A coefficients are the same to parameters. So if we have some difference in the word in the chat, we don't get confused us, that we are talking to the same thing. So we have two level explanation. We have the instance level. They are designed to extract information about the behavior of a mother related to a specific observation or instance. The data set level, that's the second part of the book. Uh, they allow obtaining information about the behavior of the model for an entire data set. Type of dependent variables. We have the categorical that I already explained and also the numericals. That was interesting to me because they say that they continuous variable is not in the mathematical sense. So integers, order variables also counts as numbers. If you say, ah, oh, no, I have them the mood coefficient, I know that this is bigger than the other. Or I have, for example, a salary level, but I don't have the salary in sub. You can take that variable as a numeric one. You have order, 
Yeah, you take it as a numeric one. Uh, also counts. Yeah, that's because we have more flexible models. We know that the, for general linear models, they really take the continuous variable really seriously. That it needs to be, it doesn't, it shouldn't be counts, it shouldn't be integers. So uh, take that in consideration. We have to explain uh, what is a glass box model. It's a model that is easy to understand. I have a simple structure that like happened with the session trees as we see below, and also linear models. It has a limited number of coefficients. They say that no much higher than 10. You have a model with 20, maybe it's not as, as clear what is the outcome. If the model change, it's a little bit hard to track by, by in your mind. What are the benefits? We can see which exploratory variables are included in the model and which are not. We can easily link changes the model predictions with changes by a particular exploratory variables. Allow us to challenge the model and group our domain knowledge because are clear and we can learn many things about them. To interpret models, we have a really good model specific resources. For linear model, we have in general linear models, we have the QQ plus, diagnostic plus, test for model structure, model for identification of a flyer, tools for identification of a flyer in the random forest and boosting all these three base models. We have the outbagging method for evaluating the performance, the variant importance. Uh, the possible interactions. For neural networks, we have flyer wise relevance, propagation techniques, and silence, and silent silence mass technique. That sounds great, but it has some limitations. One uh, cannot easily compare explanations from two models in the different structures. It's like, okay, I want to know how well is predicting these three bays uh, compared if it's doing a better job than a linear model is no so clear. It's a hard decision. And also, it's a never ending work. We need to create a new method for each model process. So when we have new models, we need to create new methods to interpret those models. Um, that reason this book don't focus their attention on that specific way. We center our attention in the model agnostic techniques. We don't assume any anything about the model structure. So even an API you can use with this model. You can evaluate how well it's doing an API because you don't need to touch and extract any part of the model to, to apply these techniques. We will assume that the model operates on a p-dimensional vector exploratory variables features and a single observ and for a single observation we on a single value, a score, a probability, which is a real number. And that and most of the models that we use uh, fit, uh, meet that condition. So yeah, we have a lot of techniques to apply to many models and take decisions about it. What do you think about, you have comments or maybe questions you need me to go back? No uh, questions. I just uh, surprised to see uh, the term glass box model. <laughs> that was kind of a new one for me. I don't know if that was the case for anyone else there. Obviously black box model is the term we're most likely all familiar with, but uh, that one's a new one to refer to more, I guess, interpretable mo models, right? Like linear models. And white bots, I used to listen more white bots, black bots, white bots. But they say glass also in the, in the book. Yeah, glass is see-through, I suppose. I don't know if, if, 
if you know how to contribute to these slides, uh, maybe because many of you is the is your first time. Uh, you go to the repo. Uh, you will see there. Uh, right here, the instructions. Uh, you see, basically, are uh, to make the contribution. But yeah, it's a uh, it's a repo. So you know how to use Git. You can use your your EDA or maybe using the command line to to fork the model, create a branch in your GitHub account and contribute to this repo, just in case you, you want to contribute to the slides. All these all these links are also in our in our chat uh, channel, yeah. yeah. All right, good. Th thank you for uh, walking through that. Uh, I believe the, the link for signing up for the various weeks uh, in terms of doing the the, the, the slides or the, the book demo, that, that was also in the on the GitHub page. Is that correct, Angel? Yeah, yes. Is, let me show you how to get there. Uh, I, I believe it's in the Slack. Uh, it's in both. I, I, I discovered, Ricardo, today that <laughs> the spreadsheet right. is also here. Oh, the okay. Cohort, that, that was new to me also. Oh, I have the link here, here. Okay, good. Nice. So, yeah, because usually I, I find them in the Slack channel. I go to exactly. The mm -hmm. In the Slack, you can find them also. Oh, good, good. So you can, yeah, you can sign. If nobody can do for next week, I would do it. But I would like somebody else contribute to next week. It's possible. So since we have time, I just want to, you know, comment on an anecdote that, it, you know, is from the from, from a real project that we did here in, in Orlando. Uh, I work in 2020. I work in a project on case complexity for a nonprofit. Okay, they it's a contractor, subcontractor for the DCF Department of Children and Families of the State of Florida, and uh, you know to make the the, the story short, uh, we did all the steps. You know, gather the data, uh, do the business understanding. You know, all the steps that the Chris model you know uh, uh, mentions, and we hon that the best model that we could get from the data that we had uh, was a light GBM model, okay? A, a, a extreme, extreme great gradient boosting. So one of the things that it was not asked by the client, but it was something that it was really kind of in the back of my mind is that we had around 60 uh, features, you know, for the model, okay? You know, we had, uh, uh, characteristics of, of the case, you know, number of children of the case, uh, the distance, for example, from the social worker, you know, to where uh, this, you know, family is, etc. So one of the things that we wanted to know is which are the variables that are more important to the model, right? The, the feature importance. And one of the things that we noticed, okay, and it was really, you know, re it, it was really uh, insightful, it was like the client was very adamant to include that distance feature, okay? Because they thought that that would create more complexity to the case. But it's interesting that the model that we you know, chose uh, didn't regard distance as, as one of the, even the top 20, <laughs> okay? From the 60 factors, the top 20. So we went back, we went back to the to the client and say, hey, you know, look, look at this, you know, you know, explain more or less what a variable important is in more or less non-technical terms. And then, you know, explain that. But the client said, that's okay. Okay. You know, I, I know what you're trying to, you know, to, to tell me that distance is not really a factor here, but just keep it. Okay. <laughs> just keep it because maybe, maybe we'll, we'll need it for some other, you know, uh, an analysis. And that's something that you have to really, you know, uh, you know, take take as a as a lesson, right? Uh, I took it as a lesson, in terms of no matter how you know sophisticated these models are, no matter how well you explain and all that, 
sometimes the client has the last word, <laughs> right? In terms of what he really wants to use the data for, okay? And it's interesting that it's still, you know, distance is, is still there in the, in the, in the, you know, in the, in the data that, that we are ingesting. So, uh, I mean, sometimes that maybe in, in the academic, you know, uh, field will be something that, okay, distance, you know, is not relevant. So, you know, let's take it out and there will be no, you know, no, no issue. Right. But, but here, because the client wanted to know a little more about how the distance affected certain kinds of interactions not necessarily the prediction, okay? So he said, no, no, uh, leave it there because we have other uses uh, for that. So uh, keep keep that in mind, okay? Because maybe in a presentation we'll be confronted, the client will confront with that. I said, no, no, leave that because, you know, we need it for other, other uh, you know, type of analysis, not necessarily prediction. <laughs> so that's my, that's my two cents on, you know, this uh, explanatory uh, adventure that we're going to have. <laughs> No, no, that's really important. Yes, thanks for sharing. Yeah, and you can't you can't always discount domain expertise, right? I mean, the <laughs> models, you know, give us a good sense of of what the you know, what predictors are important, but they're not all. It's not always uh, perfect, right? And um, you know, when applied to new data, sometimes the clients client, you know, in this case, could be correct, right? The distance is more meaningful than your analysis showed based on the data that you had. Um, so um, yeah, we, really, we, really interesting story though, for sure. Yeah, we, we took it that it was more meaningful, but for other kind of analysis, that it was not the one that we were presenting. Okay. And that and, yeah. that, has, and that also has value because, you know, depending on the client needs, that's where, you know, the value is going to be reflected, right? <laughs> <laughs> The client is, is always right. Yeah. That's right. It's always right most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's actually interesting. But for me, actually, I primarily working with uh, and, uh, normal people, like citizens, and also like uh, uh, when, when they work with, uh, when we try to deliver the outcome, it has to for the Citizens without any kind of background knowledge is working at any input what are they all feeling as for the opinion. There is a sometimes there is a lot of opportunity or a lot of chances that we have to explain our research in the most simple way. Rather than the practice including the more variable and the practice explain all of the variables that we use in the model, sometimes it is necessary for us to Kind of highlighting the what is the key in, key impact of some specific features on the, our future outcome in, in terms of the prediction purposes. For example, like uh, we, I actually working uh, working on a lot of projects with uh, based on the public inputs, like a lot of things important, and most of those things are not are not familiar with uh, what is called the urban planning process and uh, how those outcomes can be created and uh, how those outcomes can be affected in the future life. In that case, we have to sometimes be it's much easier, much uh, helpful for us and for them to understand what the outcome will be in a more reversible way rather than to try to explain all of the variables and all of the model structure and all of the model mechanism is a problem. So maybe when you work with uh, some specific clients, maybe those clients must have a, should have a lot of knowledge or maybe they are working the same way that you have in your work. So in that case, you have to explain about the more, more detail about those kind of uh, like, uh, Variable and features, and you know, how how you interpret those features in more detail. But sometimes, maybe when you work with uh, some long people, like citizens, a lot of citizens, or maybe some some residents in some specific specific neighborhood, or some old people, or even your children, you have to sometimes you have to explain your outcome more easier, more easier way so that they can understand what's, uh, what's going on in your, in your analysis. So that's also my, my insight about this thing. 
the intellectually reason why I really interested in the studying the law before the best class box kind of structure. Because uh, when we try to, it is good for us in, in terms of the predictive purposes to include all the all the potential variables to increase our predictive power. But sometimes it is very useful just kind of including the most uh, some of the key variable and then try to uh, allow us allows ourselves to understand the model a little bit more simpler way. It also holds our community delivered to the citizens in a simple and easy way. That is also kind of very important because we were also thinking about uh, maybe if if we our class is not familiar with our kind of field or our model analysis, we sometimes have to use the our kind of work try to reducing the our variable and then try to explain the some of the key variable and uh, try to simply explain about the what the some major outcome is gonna be affecting your life. I think that's the insight. Great. Uh, thanks, Kentu. So I think we are ready to stop. See you next week, guys.